Follow Alex in his quest to pass the Four Dragons Trials and become the Dragon Master, hero of the goddess Althena and protector of the world. Check this out. Bloop boop boop. Bloop doop doo. Bloop doop da ba Lunar the Silver Star is a JRPG. It was developed by Game Arts and published in the US by Working Designs. Working Designs, Western localizations, and packaging for many games were both famous. More on that in a moment. Lunar the Silver Star was released on Sega CD in 1992. It was heavily rewritten and re-released for the Sega Saturn in 1996 as Lunar Silver Star Story Complete. This version was also ported to the PlayStation in 1998, and this is the version of the game that I played. Let me show you this bonkers packaging. An extremely detailed cardboard case. Inside, we've got the two disc game. One disc is still in my PlayStation. And also, a making of documentary and the soundtrack, but also you get this hardcover instruction manual with lots of cool concept art, interviews with some of the creators, and a strategy guide for the first few dungeons and the first boss battle. It also came with this cloth map. Another working designs feature that they were known for quirky American humor in their localization. I notice it in Lunar much more than I notice it in the Ark the Lad series, which Working Designs also localized and publish, and which I also have, but I'll have to check into that when I play Ark the Lad 2, which is the next game I'm reviewing, actually. But this quirky American humor has its drawbacks. In fact, it led me to add the tone subcategory to the story category for my scores for the game. Much of the dialogue in this game is legitimately hilarious, but there are jokes about specific things like Wheaties that don't land. There are fat jokes at one character's expense, which, you know, I'm so sick of. There are some incredibly lewd sexual jokes, and there's even a joke about an IUD. But then when you get to the voice acted lines, it's all like this. Alex, you're late again, silly. Were you whittling away the morning at Dine's Monument again? Or were you planning more make-believe adventures with Ramus? It's a shame that the tone is bringing the story score down a bit because the other things in this category are all pretty good to excellent. The game follows many tropes but is charming enough that I don't mind. The world is so cohesive and vibrant and interesting. Music and religion are woven so deeply into this world, and those things show up both in the soundtrack to the game and in the gameplay, not, in, not just in the story. The only other slight dig I have at the story of the game is in the pacing. As I said in the intro, we're following Alex on his journey to meet the four dragons and become the next Dragon Master. We pass the first dragon's trial pretty much right at the beginning of the game, and then it feels like the pace swings widely between a little too slow and a little too fast for a while, until after a good long chunk of the game, we finally meet the second, third, and fourth dragons in pretty quick succession. It feels a little jarring, but not enough to make the story seem bad. Characters are fun to talk about in this game. It can be pretty hard to categorize them into heroes, villains, and NPCs, so I'm going to start by just talking about those three categories, and then running through the characters in quick fire alphabetical order. Ready? Here we go. The heroes are a really fun, lovable group. They're all well-defined, and most importantly, they all have flaws that they need to work through. Except for Alex, who's basically perfect, which is a little annoying, really. The villains are mostly good, but there are fewer of them, so one less good villain can easily bring down the average. But with heroes and villains that are overall so strong, you'd think that the NPCs are probably where they skimped on the development, but not really. They're mostly pretty good too. Alex, as mentioned, is an annoying, perfect golden boy protagonist, but there's something about him that is still so endearing. Fresca is... there. Kind of. I wish that she had more of a role and a personality. She feels like an afterthought. Galleon is so interesting, and only gets more fascinating when you get more insight into his motivations. I love Jessica. She's a priestess, and we normally expect priestesses to be demure, 
But not this gal. She's got a temper and a pretty strong attack. Kyle is my boyfriend in this game. I mean, his womanizing remarks can get a little old, but sometimes the biggest talk like that is hiding something, if you know what I mean. Also, Kyle does drag. Yes, straight men are allowed to participate in and enjoy drag, but evidence is piling up that you're not completely straight, my dude. Or maybe that's just wishful thinking, I don't know. Lakey is a strong contender for boyfriend of the game, but this time of the daddy variety. He's a beast, but also extremely sweet and also very mysterious. His story is fun once you learn it all. I love how, even when Lamia is being a kind and doting parent, she still has a stern edge. Luna could have easily been pretty annoying. I'm glad that the script, in English at least, gives her such a complicated personality. She's not just the saccharine sweet we see in her cutscenes. Mel is so much fun. I love his gimmick. He says something to seem big and threatening just because he thinks it's funny to make people feel intimidated by him. His relationship with his daughter is really sweet too. Mia is not one of my favorites, and that's too bad. She grows by the end of the game, but she spends so much of the game being so timid that it makes it really hard to connect with her. I hate Might. He's supposed to be off-putting, but he's a bit too much. In earlier playthroughs of the game years ago, I found Nall to be just really annoying, but in my most recent playthrough, I found him to be a good level of silly and cute, with some snarky mixed in, just what an animal sidekick should be. Similarly, I found Nash really annoying in earlier playthroughs, but now I like him. Rather, I like that he's annoying. It works really well for the story. Facia is an interesting one. I don't completely understand her throughout the game, but I empathize with her. Quark! Quark is so much fun. All of the dragons are, but we spend the most time with him. Ramis is another one of those intentionally kind of annoying characters. I like that he starts the game with very similar stats to Alex, but barely grows at all while Alex grows by leaps and bounds. I love when gameplay matches with a character's writing. Royce is kind of a big trope, but I don't mind. Sometimes it's fun to have a character who has some scenery-chewing campy lines, right? Tempest is a bit of a stereotypical Chief of the Plains tribe type, but he still ends up being likable and relatable. Zenobia is an unfortunately weak character, especially compared to the characters around her. In her place of prominence in the story, it's a bit of a disappointment that she doesn't have more distinguishing elements to her. As it is now, she's the less fun version of another character. As is always with these older games, diversity and gender balance are tough topics. Diversity here is par for the course. The only differences in skin color seem like they could be explained with how much time a character spends outside. I would really like to see more races represented in games, even in, or perhaps especially in, fantasy settings. And I hope none of you are thinking, but there are other humanoid races in the game. Beastmen are important characters. I would like to first ask you, which race or ethnicity of humans are the Beastmen supposed to represent? And then I'd like you to keep that thought to yourself and re-examine it a bit. Gender balance is also kind of par for the course, with only about two-fifths of the characters being anything other than men. But in this case, at least the female characters are mostly very well written, which puts it far above many games that came before it. Ultimately though, these characters feel real. Their dialogue makes sense for them, and not everyone speaks the same way. Working Designs did really well with the translation, especially on that front. As usual, I have the least to say about graphics of all the large categories in this game. I love how everything, especially cutscenes, has a 90s anime feel to it. Everything is buttery smooth in both the regular gameplay and the cutscenes, and everything seems to be a good use of the available hardware. The one nitpick I have is the same that I had with the animation of Disney's Beauty and the Beast. The computer graphics used are not a good match to everything else that's animated, and it takes me out of the moment when I notice that discrepancy. I know it would have been much more difficult to animate the sweeping shot of the ship otherwise, but to that I'd say, just don't use that shot. I think the audience would be just fine seeing that Luna is on a boat and feeling conflicted without that shot. I normally spend a lot of time in the design category, but let's see if I can speed through it this time. Though this game's design is pretty standard swords and sorcery fare, it has the right balance of variety and consistency to make it really engaging. The character designs are pretty great, and the characters all look pretty distinct. I think the only character design that's not that exciting is Mia, 
who looks like she's just wearing a nightgown. I get that the idea is to make her unfussy and unassuming, but given who she is and her status, I'd think that she'd look maybe a little fancier. I think the biggest disappointment in the character designs is how a few of the women are a little over-sexified. In fact, a little tangent on that. There's a side quest in the game that, if you happen to have one of the game's very rare bars of soap, you can take it to a bathhouse and see a scene with either all of the boy characters or all of the girl characters taking a bath. Most of the main female characters have at least one item that you can find that's a scantily clad photo of them, often looking like you're a pervert and you're, you've are you snuck a photo of them in their bedroom or something. This is already very not cool, but you can add to it with the fact that at least one of the characters is supposed to be 15. I'd wager at least one more is underage. But, putting all of that behind us, the sprites mostly do a good job of looking like the character designs and portraits. The biggest confusion comes from Ramus, whose hair turns blue when he's in battle for some reason. Otherwise, the towns and dungeons are all interesting and distinct. The music helps with that too. I think the biggest letdown is the number of forests you have to navigate. The monsters are all pretty fun looking and can be pretty terrifying when they're chasing you down on the map. The sound is maybe the biggest disappointment in this game. I'm not just talking about the music, that's mostly fine, but not amazing. It's the sound effects and voice acting that bring this score down a bit. The music is mostly pretty good. The composition is solid, and I don't get tired of hearing these songs. They're all orchestrated well too, except when there's a string section synth or a vague brass section synth. Those rarely sound good when they have leading roles in the score, but they sound much better when they're playing a supporting part. The various town themes are typically my favorites in the game, with really catchy melodies. I like how important music is to this game too. Luna's magic comes from her singing, and there's a plot point when the bad guys are abducting singers. Alex's ocarina comes in handy at a few pivotal moments in the story, and music plays heavily into all story moments involving the blue dragon. But Luna, being a singer, sings two full songs, one in the opening credits and one in the early part of the game on a boat. As a child, I really loved both of these songs, but I don't really think they hold up. For starters, the lyrics are silly. In your dreams, magical thoughts, all things are real unless you dream they're not. Also, I know Luna is supposed to be 15, but her voice is just very not special to me. La, 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 la. I know I'm probably just being a classical music snob about this. On one hand, I like that a small town nobody could be seen as exceptional. On the other hand, people from all over know about Luna's supposedly excellent singing, and gotta be real, she'd never stand out among the 15-year-old girls I knew when I was a high schooler. Many of the sound effects are actually great. For instance, a lot of the sounds that the monsters on the map make when they chase you are appropriately terrifying. Some of the sound effects for special attacks in battle and menu sound effects can get a little grating, but the biggest sound effect issue is the few sound effects that are programmed to just keep going until they end, no matter if the dialogue has passed for a long while before that. There are a few times that I can think of where a magic spell is cast in the late game when you hear that sound effect, which sounds really cool at first, but then it just keeps going, and it too starts to get grating. Gameplay is where Lunar really stands out from a lot of other games. It's a gem of a game in this category, but the walking speed is not the great part. The walking speed is really fast, which I normally like, but it only stays fun until you want to, say, walk up to a counter and talk to somebody behind the counter. The walking mechanic will often make you change directions when you walk into something, which is incredibly frustrating. I never got used to it through this most recent playthrough. The battles, however, are the great part. For starters, you can avoid battles when you're on the dungeon map. If a monster spots you, it will usually chase you, along with making some sound as mentioned in the previous section. 
This chase mechanic is occasionally used for a fun puzzle in dungeons, though, when you have to make a large monster run into something to break it and allow your passage. If the monster touches you, you get into a battle with it. Spacing within a battle is important. If you want to do melee damage to an enemy, you have to select that enemy to attack, and then the character has to run up to it to attack. If that character's range is not great enough for them to reach the enemy, they will not attack. But also, your melee fighters will be able to provide multiple hits per turn by the end of the game. If the enemy they've targeted dies and they still have attacks left, they'll walk to the next closest one, if it's in range, and continue the assault. By the end of my game, Alex was attacking five times per turn, which helped to decimate many of the enemies. Spacing of characters is important for special attacks, too. Many magic attacks affect a range of enemies or player characters, and a few attacks go in a straight line, hitting everyone in that range. There's a bit of grinding necessary for this game, but I usually didn't find it too bad. Typically, you have to grind until you're strong enough to make it through the dungeon, less so for bosses, since bosses level up with you. But even with some grind required, I found myself getting less tired of this battle system by the end of the game than I am with most RPGs. What did professional critics think of this game? Game Ranking's aggregated score is an 86%, and Metacritic's aggregated score is a 78%. If we follow the formula I use, this game gets an 83%. I feel like this game deserves a 90%. If you average my two scores, this game score comes to an 87% or a B. Here's where this game fits in with the games around it. Ramin's scores are averaged into two of those games, and Erica's score is averaged into one of them. Each of these scores has a video on the channel that you can check out if you want to learn more about all of our thoughts on them. So, do I think you might enjoy this game? I'll say probably. Even though its inconsistent tone might turn a few people off, and a few more people might be turned off by the saccharine sweet elements, or the very 90s and occasionally inappropriate references, I think most RPG fans would at least kind of enjoy it. The biggest trouble is that Working Designs didn't make a huge number of copies of this game, and it can be hard to come by. A quick internet search for me right now shows prices as high as $450 or even $2,000, but I'm seeing one for as low as $30 if you don't care about getting the full box and everything that came with this release. If you want to check out this game for yourself, I'd recommend you do some research and make sure you're getting what you want with the purchase and that the seller seems reputable. Thanks for watching. Have you played Lunar? Is this a game you think you might like? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Give this video a like if you liked it, or give it a pity like if you didn't like it. I promise it won't hurt. Two, this side is a video that YouTube thinks you might like, so check that out. If you're interested in seeing even more of our videos, then click that button up there in the corner and explore our playlists for game reviews, music reviews, and more. And subscribe while you're there. That's it for this one. Maintain your groovy selves.